Okay, let's go ahead and get started. We're starting Hamlet today. <coughs> We're going to be on Hamlet for several days. I think it's about two weeks, something like that. <coughs> um, we were supposed to start it the Friday before spring break, so about one day off. Uh, we'll be probably two days on the first act, probably be two days on each of the acts, except I think one of them is going to be three. A um, couple of background things. Your introduction mentions that Hamlet is what's called a revenge tragedy, which is different than just the regular classical tragedy like the two tragedies of Sophocles we read, in that in a revenge tragedy, in your book on 1237, uh, gives some of the qualifications. A revenge tragedy involves usually the protagonist seeking vengeance, revenge, for the death of a family member. Okay? A ghost is almost always involved, the ghost of the dead family member or or dead family members. <clears throat> and by Shakespeare's day, um, that revenge happened on stage with, by the end of the play, um, a lot of dead bodies, okay? Uh, in Act Five, we end up with Act five ends up with four corpses on the stage. If you remember in our discussion of Greek tragedy and what Aristotle says about Greek tragedy, um, in Greek tragedy, nobody ever dies on stage. Nobody's ever maimed when Oedipus gouges out his eyes. All that happens off the stage. That was considered uh, impolite, uh, inappropriate for something to be witnessed. By Shakespeare's day, that all happens on the stage. Uh, if we were doing King Lear, we would see in King Lear, a guy gets his eyes gouged out by somebody else. Okay, you know, special effects kind of a thing, all right? Um, couple things about Hamlet. Shakespeare doesn't invent the, the story by any means. It's based upon an old Danish story about a prince named Ambleth, okay, <coughs> whose father is murdered and the prince has to avenge his father's death. Uh, the father's murdered by his brother. Same thing, obviously, here. It's thought that before we get Shakespeare's Hamlet, and this is just a term that's used, that there was a, what's called an Ur Hamlet. And all that means is there's probably some lost source between this one and Shakespeare's. We just don't know what it is. It doesn't survive, right? Hamlet, the play, Shakespeare's Hamlet, survives in a couple of different versions. Um, it's one of the plays for which we have more than one copy. Okay? It's not one of those 22 plays that shows up in the first folio printed in 1623 for the first time. Uh, it survives in a couple of different quarto versions, as well as the first folio version, and there are differences be in the readings of um, between those two plays. Okay. There's a modern version of this, but it's not called Hamlet. It's a Disney film, 1994. It's Lion King. It's essentially Hamlet. Simba is Hamlet, Mufasa is Hamlet's father, Hamlet Sr. Um, Scar is Hamlet Sr., Mufasa's brother. It's pretty much the same play, okay? So, page 1238, look at the Dramatis Personae, the list of characters. So you have Claudius, king of Denmark, Hamlet, son to the late and nephew to the present king, Okay, so notice that. He's 
son to the previous king, nephew to the current king. That in itself tells you the king's brother has become the new king. Okay? In pretty much most in most Germanic societies, eldest son becomes king upon the death of the father. It's what's called primogenitor. All right? Doesn't happen here. That's a problem. Then you have Polonius, who's the Lord Chamberlain. <coughs> He's the second most powerful person in the kingdom. Horatio, Hamlet's friend. Laertes, son to Polonius, etc., etc. <coughs> Notice that almost all the names are Roman. They're not Germanic. Hamlet is Germanic. Claudius isn't. Polonius, Horatio, Voltamon, Cornelius, none of those are. Um, Rosencrantz is Germanic, Guildenstern's not really, and then you know all the others are pretty much um, Roman or Latin, if you want. Okay, so you have a bunch of other characters we're not going to talk about at this point. The play opens Act One at Elsinore. Elsinore is a town; it's not the name of the castle, <clears throat> and it opens on a platform like a battlement. Uh, raised area out in front of the castle, okay? Two men come in, they're sentinels, so they're keeping watch at night. And the play begins with the question, who's there? It's kind of a significant question because what does that question imply? If you're standing guard duty, okay, what are you doing? For what? Something or someone. And so when they say who's there, that's showing how are they taking their guard duty. They're being serious about it. They're paying attention. Okay. The who's there implies, one, somebody is there, somebody's out there, and two, they are alert. Okay. The reason I'm emphasizing this is throughout the play, we're kind of going to get this metaphor, <coughs> excuse me, this metaphorical who's there. And what I mean by that is throughout the play, <coughs> we are going to see a lot of spying. Because what do you do when you spy? You're keeping an eye out. You're keeping aware. You're keeping a lookout for things that are going on, usually that shouldn't be going on. So, who's there? Bernardo, Francisco, nay, answer me, stand and unfold yourself. So they're both addressing whoever, whatever made this noise, okay? Bernardo, long live the king. He's responding to Francisco. Bernardo, he, yep, that's me. You come most carefully upon your hour. In other words, you're cutting it close. <laughs> you were supposed to. He's implying you should have been here earlier, okay? He says, it's 12. I arrived on time. Go to bed, okay? Francisco, thanks. Why? It's cold, and I'm sick at heart. I'm sick at heart it has nothing to do with it being cold. I'm sick at heart means something's troubling me, okay? Bernardo, have you had quiet guard? Not a mouse stirring. Shakespeare's the progenitor of that phrase. You know, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse from here. Okay? So he says, Good night. If you meet Horatio Marcellus, the rivals of my watch, and you got a gloss down there at the bottom, partners, there's, they should be here too. Tell them to get a move on. Horatio and Marcellus come in. Okay? They ask, Who's there? Excuse me. Francisco asks, Who's there? He's making sure it's. Horatio Marcellus, they say friends to the crown, liegemen to the Dane, etc. Okay, so Francisco leaves, and we now have Bernardo, Marcellus, and Horatio. In line twenty-one, Marcellus asks, "Has this thing appeared again tonight?" Now we don't know what this thing is at this point. 
Bernardo, have seen nothing. Okay. Marcellus, Horatio says, tis but our fantasy. Okay. Remember Theseus' speech about fantasy and imagination. How the imagination can give shape to airy nothing and can make a bush look like a bear. Horatio says, whatever this thing that has appeared is, it's our fantasies, it's our imagination, meaning it's not real. And will not, top of 1240, uh, line 24, and will not let belief take hold of him touching this dreaded sight, twice seen of us. He doesn't believe it. Why? Why doesn't Horatio believe what Bernardo and Marcellus have, seen, have said they've now seen twice? They haven't seen it this night yet. They've seen it two previous nights. Okay? So because Horatio doesn't believe that they've seen what they've said they've seen, Bernardo says, it ain't Bernardo, right? Marcellus says, I've invited Horatio to come keep watch with us. Maybe it'll show up again. What's, what's he getting at? Horatio doesn't believe it. Why? He's not seeing it with his own eyes. Maybe if he sees it, he'll believe it. Okay? That if this apparition come, he may approve our eyes and speak to it. So, Bernard says, sit down and I'll tell you again what it is we've seen for two nights. So, Bernardo says, last night, when that star that's westward from the pole had made its course to illumine that part of heaven where now it burns, in other words, last night at this exact time, the bell then beat one, and you almost get an inkling or you maybe some productions, you hear a bell, boom, and the ghost appears. Peace break the off, look where it comes again. Bernardo, and it looks like the dead king. Now who's the dead king? Dead king, jump your arm, is Hamlet Sr. Okay, two Hamlets. Hamlet Sr., who's dead, and Hamlet Jr., who's the prince. Marcellus, now we're a scholar. Speak to it, Horatio, and you've got a gloss down there. Scholar, exorcisms were performed in Latin, which Horatio, as an educated man, would be able to speak. The footnote is misleading because the footnote is implying what? That just because Horatio knows Latin, because he's a student, that's what's meant by scholar. He's a student. He's a university student. That because he knows Latin, he is going to do and is able to do what? Perform an exorcism. What do you do in an exorcism? You send demons, spirits, away. That's not implied there at all, that that's what they're saying. All that's implied there is, golly gee, you're a lot smarter than we are. You talk to it. Okay? Bernardo, doesn't it look like the dead king? Horatio, most like. It harrows me with fear and wonder. Harrows, lacerates the feelings. Think about that phrase for a minute. How do you lacerate feelings? What the hell does that even mean? It's scaring the hell out of them. That's what it means. Just as uh, Francisco earlier was, you know, troubled in his heart, that's how Horatio is now. Notice, does Horatio still not believe? Mm, not sure. But he definitely sees it, and it, whatever it is, is having an effect on him. Okay? 
Speak to her, Horatio. What art thou that usurps this time of night, together with that fair and warlike form in which the magistrate of Barry did, mar did sometimes march? By heaven, I charge thee, speak. Okay? Bunch of stuff in that little four line speech. What art thou that usurps this time of night? Notice he doesn't say who. <laughs> Why not? I don't know what this is. Is it a ghost? What? Anybody, what's a ghost? Yeah. Of? Somebody who's dead, right? The spirit hasn't gone to rest. It hasn't gone to where it's supposed to go. So it's sticking around for whatever reason. The usual popular, you know, mythological reason is it has unfinished business. It's got to do something, okay? So, is it dead? We don't know. It looks like the dead king. So, that usurps this time of night. What does usurp mean? It's to take over, to take control of, but it's to do it wrongly or illegally. English popular belief is that spirits, ghosts, show themselves at nighttime. They don't during the day. There's something about daylight that, you know, they don't like, okay? So, it's taken over the night, it shouldn't be there, together with that war, fair and warlike form. That is, Horatio is saying, whatever this thing is, it has also usurped the physical appearance of the dead king. That's implying, whatever you are, you aren't the spirit of the dead king. You've appropriated that form, okay? And notice what the form looks like. It's not just the dead king. It's in which, it, that fair and warlike form, in which the majesty of Barry Denmark did sometimes march. In other words, this image of Hamlet Sr. is dressed how? He's ready to go to bed? No. Armed to the teeth. He's dressed for battle. And then Horatio says, by heaven I charge thee speak. In order for an exorcist, according to you know, traditional Catholic slash Christian doctrine, because not only Catholics practice exorcisms, according for an exorcist to be effective, what was what must that exorcist have? Anybody know? There's a passage in the Gospels where Jesus sends out his disciples in groups of two, okay? And they come back, and some of them say, you know, there are these people with spirits in them, and we couldn't do anything. We commanded them to leave, but they wouldn't leave. And Jesus says, these kind only come out by faith and prayer. You gotta have faith, you gotta believe in the one that you're using, whose name you're using, to command the spirits to leave. Here, the name is by heaven. And yet we're gonna find out, <coughs> Horatio, probably doesn't believe in heaven. Horatio is what's called a Stoic. A Stoic was a Roman philosophy, philosophical belief system, that said, essentially, you want a happy life? Here's what you do. You just kind of try to maintain an even keel. You don't get really excited about anything. You don't get really down about anything. You live a life of moderation. That's it. You don't get drunk. You don't party. You just live life simply. And the Stoics believed there's nothing after you die. Just as there's nothing before you're born for you. You don't exist. And when you die, you don't exist. You have no soul. You just disappear. All right? 
A Stoic can't say, by heaven, I charge you. Because you have to believe that there's a heaven and that there's a God in heaven. All right? Marcellus, it is offended. That's a stage direction. Because when Horatio charges it, whatever this image is, does something. Turns its back, starts to walk away. I think it'd be, frankly, it would be interesting to have a modern director have the ghost flip them off. Like, you have no control over me. It doesn't matter what it is. All it implies is that whatever this image is, isn't, it isn't paying any attention. See, it stalks away. Horatio, stay, speak, speak, I charge thee. And the ghost leaves. Okay? So now Bernardo. How now, Horatio? Now what do you think? You tremble and look pale. Why? <clears throat> Whatever this thing is, it's real. Okay? Is not this something more than fantasy? Isn't this more than just an airy nothing? In other words, you gotta, I think at least, you gotta read which talked about fantasy here in light of Theseus' speech. Come on, explain. Horatio, before my God, <laughs> hmm. before my God, I might not disbelieve without the sensible and true avouch of my own eyes. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it for myself. Okay? Remember when we were talking about a good man is hard to find, and the misfit, towards the very end of the story, the misfit's talking to the grandmother, and he says, Jesus threw everything off. What's his problem with that whole story about Jesus throwing everything off by raising the dead? He wasn't there. He didn't see it for himself, because he implies, if I had seen it, I wouldn't be the way I am now, okay? Horatio has seen it. Marcellus, isn't it like the king? <laughs> As thou art to thyself, okay? Like, like is a word that is used for a simile. You're comparing two things, all right? It's to, like the king. That means literally, it's not the king, it's similar to the king. Look at Horatio's response. As thou art to thyself. Well, how are you to yourself? Are you like yourself? No, <laughs> you are you. Horatio is saying, that's not like the king. That is the king. Such was the very armor he had on when he, the ambitious Norway, combated, so frowning. He looked like this when he led our troops into war against the king of Norway. Okay? Marcellus, he says, we've seen this guy, this image, twice before, in this same hour. Horatio, why he's here, I don't know. But in the gross and scope of my opinion, that is, as best as I can guess, this bodes some strange eruption to our state. This is a portent. This is an omen. Something bad is coming. Okay? So, Marcellus says, sit down and tell us why we're keeping watch. Okay? They're just dumb grunts. They've been ordered, stand watch. They don't know why. So, <clears throat> Horatio says, oh, I can explain that. And he gives us some background. Our last king, Hamlet Sr., whose image even now but appeared to us, he says, was, as you know, by Fort and Brav, Norway, there to, pricked on by a most eminent pride, dared to the combat. Fort and Brav of Norway is the name of the 
previous king of Norway. Right? So, previous king of Norway essentially challenged king of Denmark to single combat. Hamlet Sr. defeated Fortinbras Sr. And they're, by the way, they're both also just referred to as Denmark, excuse me, Denmark, and Fortinbras is going to be referred to just as Norway. Just like we will often, you'll hear in the news, you know, the White House said, well, the White House doesn't literally speak. What is meant by that? Joe Biden said, or Washington said, the American government said, okay? So he goes on and says, now young Fortinbras, that is dead Fortinbras' son, what? Of unimproved metal, hot and full, that is, he's not been challenged, he's not been tried, tested, he has in the skirts of Norway here and there sharped up a list of lawless residents. He wants to go to war. He wants to prove himself. Okay? So the current king of Denmark has got his people on alert. He wants to recover, top of 1242, those lands lost by his father. Cool. Bernardo, you know, I think you're right. And I think that's why we're seeing the image of the dead king armed. He's telling us something, all right? So, he says, so like the king that was and is the question of these wars. Bernardo says that. Horatio, it is a moat to trouble the mind's eye. What's a moat? speck of dust. There's a biblical illusion here. Jesus says, before you go judging others, do what? Before you go pulling the speck of dust out of somebody else's eye, because they don't see properly, take the beam out of your eye. Notice a speck of dust versus a beam, a log. Horatio says, this is a speck of dust to do what? To trouble the mind's eye. Right? The imagination, so to speak. And then he goes on and explains what happened before Julius Caesar was assassinated. Today's March 10th, Friday's the 15th. The quote-unquote Ides of March. According to History, Caesar, Julius Caesar, received a prophecy. The prophecy spoken by the soothsayer told Caesar, beware the Ides of March, the middle of the March, it's the 15th. Caesar didn't pay attention. Shakespeare wrote a play about it called The Tragedy of Julius Caesar. Caesar didn't pay attention. And on the 15th of March, he went to the Senate and he was assassinated by his so-called friends. Okay. And so Horatio goes on to explain what some of those portents and omens were that Caesar should have been paying attention to. The grave stood empty, various things happened, the ghost comes back in. So Horatio says, I'll cross it, that is, I'm going to stand in its way. I'm going to get up in its face. Though it blast me. Stay illusion. Now, when he calls it illusion, is he saying this isn't real? No. Illusion means bad vision. Stay bad vision. Stop. <laughs> because he's indicating he wants it to speak to him. If thou hast any sound or use of voice, Speak to me. If there be any good thing to be done. So notice, he's giving the ghost options. If you can speak. Okay? Speak. Okay? Second, if there be any good thing to be done, 
that may to thee do ease and grace to me speak to me. If there's something good to be performed, if there is a good charitable act to be performed, that will one, bring peace, solace, relief to you, that's the ease, and grace to me, speak. It's the first, in one sense, it's the first religious idea Shakespeare brings into the play. Okay? One thing you're going to get tired of hearing by the time we get to the end of this play, this play is full of religious controversy. It's largely about the debate between Protestantism and Catholicism in Shakespeare's day. We're going to see a mixture of Catholic beliefs and Protestant beliefs. Right? Shakespeare doesn't come down on one side or the other. Grace to me is heavenly grace. Grace of God. Something that benefits my soul. Okay? Speak. If thou art privy to thy country's fate, which for knowing may avoid, speak. It was thought Ghosts knew the future. Why? Because ghosts are dead people. <laughs> Where are dead people? Or let me rephrase that. Where in time do the dead exist? They're ghosts, they're, they're spirits. They're not in time. They're outside time. Okay? To be outside time, they see Yesterday and tomorrow, now. It's just the present. So, if you can tell us something that will enable us to forestall some great disaster, speak. Last option. Or if thou hast apported in thy life extorted treasure in the womb of earth, for which they say you spirits oft walk in death, speak. Now that's an interesting last, you know, Possibility. Again, a popular idea that the ghosts, those who become ghosts, do so because they've got buried treasure, essentially. Okay? That they did what? They hoarded in life. This is an old idea, at least in English literature. And the idea is that Money and wealth are essentially for one purpose. They're not to be stored in a bank. They're to do good with. They're to use to help others. All right? So if you've uphoarded this wealth, that is, said, mine, <laughs> and not helped others with it, speak. Notice, Horatio doesn't kind of give the second half. The second half being, tell me where it is, and I will open it up and distribute it like to the poor. Speak. Okay? Stay and stop at Mar. Why does he say stop at Marcellus? Again, it's a stage direction. The ghost is now moving in the direction of Marcellus probably to one of those doors. And he's saying, get in front of it. Marcellus is thinking, hell no. You're the scholar. You're the one who should stop it. Shall I strike it with my partisan? Okay. Long-handled spear with a blade. You know, it's a ghost. What good is a weapon going to do? It leaves. Marcellus, we do it wrong being so majestical to offer it this show of violence. Meaning, we wouldn't do that to the king while he was alive. We shouldn't do it to his ghost. For it is as the heir invulnerable. We couldn't stop this thing if we wanted to. It was about to speak. And then the cock crew. And Horatio tells us more popular British 
belief. Upon, uh, I have heard that the cock that is the trumpet to the morn doth with his lofty and shrill sounding throat awake the god of day. And at his warning, whether in sea or fire, in earth or air, that is, whatever a spirit may be, whether it's in the ocean, burning in the fire, in the air, or buried in the ground, the extravagant and airy spirit hies to his confine. That is, the spirit goes to essentially where the body is. If the body belonged to a sailor, the spirit goes back to the ocean where the body is. If the body was burned, it goes to the nearest fire. If it's buried, it goes there. Okay. <coughs> Marcellus, it faded on the growing of the cock. Some say that ever against that season come to wherein our Savior's birth is celebrated, Christmas, the bird of dawning sings all night, and no spirit, no spirit moves abroad. Again, this is a folk belief in Shakespeare's day. It was thought at Christmas time, the cock, the rooster, doesn't only crow first thing in the morning. It crows around the clock. And therefore, at Christmas time, all the spirits stay asleep. Okay? Horatio, so I've heard also, and partially believe it. So he says, let's tell Hamlet. And get him to watch with us, all right? Scene two. So the scene on the outside of the castle, middle of the night, take that back, one o'clock, 12, 12 p.m. to one o'clock, 12 a.m., excuse me, to one o'clock, freezing cold is left. Now we go inside the castle, okay? It's not the same time. This is probably the next morning. And we have Claudius enter with his wife, the queen, counselors, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and the king gets a long speech. Though yet of Hamlet our dear brother's death, the memory be green. In other words, he hasn't been dead long. Big question. How long has Hamlet Sr. been dead? We're going to get conflicting answers. Okay? And that it us be fitted to bear our hearts in grief and our whole kingdom to be contracted into one brow of woe. Meaning, <clears throat> I'm not going to use Biden because he's too old. JFK. How did, did JFK die a natural death? No, he was assassinated. How old was he? Late 40s. So-called prime of life. What did the United States as a country do when JFK was assassinated? Or MLK, or Bobby Kennedy. Okay. The country as a whole mourned. I mean, everything stopped. Okay. That's what Claudius is talking about. The whole kingdom is contracted. It's reduced to a single brow of woe. Crying. So he says, yet so far hath discretion fought with nature that we with wisest sorrow think, in him, think on him together with remembrance of ourselves. What does he mean? He's suggesting something, comes up a lot in Shakespeare. It's used throughout Renaissance art. Memento mori. Remember your death, or you could also translate it, reminder of death, meaning we all die, and we should remember that. Why? To be prepared. So, he says, we with wisdom looked on the death of our brother and thought of ourselves. I, too, will die. So, he says, 
Therefore, our sometime sister, now our queen. So she was my sister. Ours, they're the royal we. Now she's my queen. What's she telling us? I'm married by dead brother's wife. Anybody know what that's considered? I think in almost all the states of the United States, that's called incest. Why? The Old Testament does not allow that. You can't marry your dead brother's wife. You can't marry your dead brother's uh, daughter, etc. Okay. Therefore, our sometime sister, now our queen, the imperial jointress, notice the imagery we've joined together to this warlike state, have we, as twere with the defeat of joy, with an auspicious and a dropping eye, with mirth and funeral and with dirge and marriage, in equal scale, weighing delight and dole, taken to wife. How long has this brother been dead? Not long enough that they are no longer mourning. And so what did he say we did? In our mourning, we kind of balanced it out with happiness. How so? I married Gertrude. So we mix sorrow with joy. It should give you an, an ew reaction. <clears throat> Nor have we here in Bard your better wisdoms, which have <clears throat> really gone with this affair along. <clears throat> what has he just done? Okay, He said, we haven't barred your wisdom. That is, we took your counsel. We got your opinion on this. Which have freely gone of their own free will. They, they his counselor, his advisors, did what? No, 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 go right ahead, marry the dead king's wife, your sister-in-law. He's kind of sp spreading the blame, so to speak. In other words, if I was wrong for doing this, you were all wrong for going along with it, is what he's saying. Thanks. Thanks. For all, that is, for everything you've done for us, thanks. Now, he goes on and talks about young Fortinbras, the young prince of Norway. All right? He says, he started, you know, rattling sabers, therefore we are armed up, etc., etc. So he sends messengers, ambassadors, off to old Norway, okay? The current king, not Fortinbras Sr., probably his brother. So Cornelius and Voltemann go off. Then the king addresses Laertes, who is the son of Polonius. Polonius is the king's right-hand man. So he says, what's the news with you, etc., etc.? You're going back off to university. He says, I'd like to go back to France. Cool, go ahead. Your father says it's okay. He does. You have my blessing. Okay? So, Laertes leaves. And then the king, line 64, addresses Hamlet. But now my cousin Hamlet and my son. And you've got a gloss down at the bottom. Cousin just means what? Any family relation not of the immediate nuclear family. Nephew. Or it could literally be cousin. But not son, not brother. You know, wouldn't use cousin to refer to that closer relation. But no, my cousin Hamlet and my son. And then we get a stage direction, a side. And a side is when the actor looks to the audience and speaks to the audience. Right? When Hamlet says the line he says, Claudius doesn't hear it. Nobody on the else on the stage should hear that. All right? It's not the same as a soliloquy. A soliloquy occurs when the actor is alone on the stage. There is no one 
else there. Okay? What is Hamlet saying this aside? To the audience, a little more than kin and less than kind. A little more than kin. Yeah, we're a little bit closer than cousin. How much closer? You're my uncle. How much closer? And now you're my stepfather. And less than kind means not. And less than nice. And less than gentle. It means less than natural. Why? Hamlet is telling the audience, his, the king's, relation to me is now unnatural. Because he married my mother, who is his sister-in-law. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? What does it mean? Hamlet's walking around like he's always under a storm cloud. Not so, my lord. I'm too much in the sun. Too much in the sun. Think you've got a boss. What Hamlet is saying is, I am too much in your presence. Because the king, the idea is, the king is the light of the country. The country revolves, so to speak, around the king, like the earth revolves around the sun. We get our light from the sun. The, the state gets its light from the king. There is actually a French king, Louis XIV, who named himself the Sun King. I am the son of all of France, essentially. Okay? So Hamlet says, no, there are no clouds. How can I be in the clouds when I'm always in your presence, is what he's implying. Okay? The queen speaks. She's his mother. Good Hamlet, cast thy nighted color off. That's getting back to the clouds. Hamlet's dressed in black. Why? Because he likes black? Possibly, but not really. What color do you wear to funerals? Black. black. What color do you wear to weddings, especially if you're the bride? White. <coughs> it's purity, all that kind of thing. Black is a symbol, <coughs> symbolic color for mourning. Why? Because the sun is set. It's darkness now. It's nighttime because the light of your life is no longer metaphorically there. Good Hamlet, cast thy night in color off and let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. Not Denmark the country, Denmark the king. Do not forever with thy veiled lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. Does that mean Hamlet's literally going around going, Dad, are you there? No. It means when he walks, he walks like this. His head is towards the ground. So when people come up towards him as he's walking, what do they see? They don't see his eyeballs. They see his eyelids. That's why she says, your eyes are veiled. Thou knowst his common. What is common? All that lives must die passing through nature to eternity. Remember I said, where does the ghost or when does the ghost exist? Outside of time, in eternity. So what is common, the queen says? Everything that lives dies. What's her point? Suck it up, son. Get with the program. OK, daddy's dead. Move on. How long has he been dead? We don't know yet. Hamlet, aye, madam. It is common, that is, yes, every one of us in this room will die. <laughs> it, death affects everything living. Big freaking deal. Well, if it is, she says, if it be, why seems it so particular to thee? Why, and there's that subjunctive verb. Seems. Seems always indicates a condition contrary to fact. Donald Trump seems like a very humble person. No one would ever say that. Well, Trump would, okay? 
Joe Biden seems like the quickest wit, smartest person in the world. No one would say that, okay? It's not true. It indicates something that is contrary to fact. Hamlet, she says, why seems it so? Why does the fact of death seem particular to you? What, what's her point? Why can't you get beyond this? The death of his father, Hamlet. Seems? Nay, it is. Hamlet's saying, no, I don't seem upset. I am upset. Why? It's my father, Hamlet says. It is, I know not seems. And so he's going to play on that word seems. Okay, I mentioned spying earlier as one of the themes or issues. Acting pretending. This is another huge one. He says, "'Tis not alone my inky cloak, a good mother, nor customary suits of solemn black, nor windy suspiration of forced breath, no, nor the fruitful river in the eye, nor the dejected havior face, of the visage, together with all forms, mood, shapes of grief that can denote me truly. Denote, difference between denotations and connotations. Denotations, literal dictionary definitions of the word. Connotations, all the possible meanings that word can have. Like the word blue. Several of you have, are wearing blue. It's a color. What can it also mean? A little sad, a little down, moody. Hamlet's saying all these things he's just talked about, clothing, sighing, tears, a sad looking face, these are what? These are scenes. Why? Because you can act those. Hamlet says, these are the actions a man might play. But I have that within which passes show. That is, I've got something inside that cannot be acted. These, all these other things, the clothing, all that, these are but the trappings and the suits of woe. What does he mean? I am woe. I am sorrow. I am sadness. I am pain. All this other stuff, that's just what I wear. What's Hamlet just told his mother? I am really hurting. And she doesn't get it. Nobody gets it. So if you're hurting that badly, what does that mean? person needs help, right? If someone's hurting that badly, a lot of people would say, you need to see someone, you need to talk to someone. This isn't National Suicide Month, that's September, but you know, it, it's, it's that time to have the conversation. Because Hamlet is going to tell us, as soon as everybody else leaves, oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his can against self-slaughter. What's self-slaughter? Those are English words. What's the Latin for that? Sui, self-side. Death, self-death. Hamlet's first soliloquy is about suicide. The so-called greatest soliloquy in the English language. One is not a soliloquy. Hamlet's not alone when he says to be or not to be. That speech is about suicide, though. Okay, we'll stop there. Um, Wednesday, we're going to pick up with the king's response on page 1246. There is a quiz up for this, like, second half, whatever, of Midsummer Night's Dream. It's due, I changed the due date today. It's due Wednesday, Wednesday night.